uh, here on. Welcome everybody. We are uh, coming to the end of our uh, Kent seminar series. Today, uh, Yu Qian will uh, present his uh, PhD uh, research uh, material and he will be, he will be defending soon. And his presentation will be about discrete element uh, modeling of radial ballast behavior. Uh, Yu's uh, work in the transportation group with Dr. Tumler since 2010 and as, as I said, he will be finishing his PhD soon. So without further ado, I will let uh, you start this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you for your time and uh, welcome to this presentation. Uh, hopefully, this is not the uh, worst ever. I only have 100 slides. Maybe 101 slides will take about three hours. So, first, I would like to thank all my committee members, especially Professor Tuchumla, Professor Hashas, and Professor Kapusi for their uh, great help and uh, advice throughout this study. And also my great colleague and partner, Song Jie Li, who already defends his PhD material. And uh, I'm another research assistant in this research project. Yes, I look much nicer before this study was started. So the outline of this uh, research is to, the objective of this study is to develop the DEM, which is discrete element method, to simulate framework as a quantitative simulation tool to predict the ballast performance and to better understand the nature of ballast, the particular nature, complex ballast behavior on the complex dynamic loading and also the fault and degradation change and its impact on the track performance. This research uh, has a systematic, uh, systematic multi-scale approach. At the beginning, we will quantify the green size properties such as image analysis of the shape properties and also the green size distribution. And then we go through the uh, lab laboratory testing. And through the DEM, we collect the information from laboratory testing and use discrete element method to simulate the ballast behavior. Eventually, we want to develop this simulation tool as a quantitative analysis and to predict the track performance in a field scale. We also try to make this simulation tool a user-friendly graphic software. So we try to develop our GUI at the same time. So hopefully we will have the first beta version released to the market pretty soon. So what is discrete element method? And why we try to use that for ballast behavior simulation? It is because the ballast is itself on the track. It's not a continuum medium. It's constituted by discrete elements, which was the aggregates. So to better understand the track performance and the ballast behavior, uh, it's very essential to understand the ballast behavior because to mitigate the uh, track problems and failure due to ballast breakdown and the degradation and also lateral movements and instability. These are the key behavior that are caused by uh, discrete elements. Before the discrete element method was introduced, we have continuum approach to simulate, for example, the finite element method other methods, for example, finite difference method. They can be simulated uh, different kinds of uh, ballast behavior. However, some of the problems happen in the field that cannot be simulated very, very well with the continuum approach. For example, the ballast lateral stability, ballast migration, and right now, during the high-speed uh, train operation, the ballast flying and also ballast projection. This kind of field happen. Um, problems cannot be simulated very well with the current continuum-based approach. With the help of this continuum-based approach, also as the discrete element method, we are capable to capture the particular nature of ballast behavior. So, to now, we know discrete element method is helpful, but what is discrete element method? It's actually, in our daily life, this is a very good example of discrete element method, the Angry Bird. Just think about it. When you play your Angry Bird in your cell phone or tablet, you actually use the discrete element to hit each other. And then you compute the displacement of each other. So it's in our daily life. It's originally, <laughs> it's originally introduced by Professor Kondo and Stark to study the micro contact between particles in UK in 1979. It's explicitly considering the microscopic interaction between rigid bodies. 
However, the drawback is its computational expense, very expensive. So think about it, we have two rigid body, and once they click with uh, collision with each other, we allow a certain overlap between the two particles, uh, and we can calculate the contacting force between the two rigid body, and then we can use the force and also the uh, Newton's second law to update the acceleration and update the position of next time step and also to calculate the new contacts and also in the next step we can calculate the new force and make a loop for iteration. So the principle is very straightforward. A lot of discrete element method, uh, uh, the discrete element method itself is not very difficult. And there are also a lot of open source discrete element uh, simulation tool software available in the market. However, most of them are use sphere particles or circles in 2D case, but we don't want to use sphere particles. However, a realistic particle shapes are needed to be introduced into discrete element simulation. Why we try to use this kind of like a polyhedron particles is for example, you have a slope. If you use uh, sphere particles, it cannot simulate the behavior very well. Instead, if you use polyhedron particles, it will be much more realistic to capture the behavior of uh, specific particles. But here comes another problem. If we use the uh, polyhedron particles, it's very difficult to make a judgment when the two particles will be in contact with each other. For example, if we use the fair particles, we only need two information, two parameters, to make a judgment of the interaction of two particles. One is the position of the particle central. Another is the radius of the particle. That's all we need. But if you have polyhedron particles, how can you make a judgment of when these two particles are in contact or not? So when we introduce polyhedron particles, it was significant increase the computational load. Professor Kondo later on, about 10 years later, introduced a concept called common plan method. So instead of track the different particles, we can draw a plan which can separate the particles if they are not in contact. If the two particles are in contact, they must contact together with a common plan. So this, this method significantly speed up the detecting of contacts. Okay, next I will introduce how the DEM simulation tool was developed in University of Illinois. In 1990, Professor Gabusi and uh, his co-workers developed, developed the world's first polyhedron 3D DEM code in University of Illinois called Blocks 3D and it was used to simulate multiple um, engineering problems. And then since 2000, Professor Hashash and his co-workers um, coded the second generation of the DEM simulation code. You can see now we drop the C, so it becomes block 3D. The second generation have uh, improved the contact detecting algorithm and significantly save the computational expense. In 2006, there's another method called the shortest link method introduced by uh, Dr. Nazami, Professor uh, Hashashi's student. So instead of you try to find a common plan, which first find the shortest link, which can save a lot of computational expense for much faster detection of the common plane and then detect the contacts of particles. The current generation is the third, co third generation of the code block 3D with enhanced algorithm for large scale discrete element simulation. For large scale we will be able to simulate the full scale track and a large scale track to test. And in 2012, uh, my colleague Lee, uh, Song Jie Lee, and they added uh, the incremental discriminant scheme in the track to test, which I will be explaining much in detail, much more in details later on. So, mean, at the meantime of we developing the code, we also try to quantify the particle shapes to a more detailed scale. Start from 2000, Professor Tutumula and his co um, colleagues try to use the image approach to quantify the particle shape properties. This is the first generation of uh, University of Illinois aggregate image analyzer, 
right now it's already been upgraded to the second generation which can capture the color picture in a more much higher resolution so we already have the much more realistic particles we also have the very fast the discrete element method code so we'll be able to simulate a lot of different engineering problems so next let's focus on how we use this method to simulate the ballast behavior before I joined the professor Tutuluman's group, uh, Dr. Hai Huan, right now an assistant professor in Penn State, he did the laboratory calibration and validation of this numerical approach in nature, actually. So he first studied the aggregate shape effect on the direct shear behavior of ballast materials, and also he did some simulation with the ballast lateral stability and the strength of fault ballast. Pay attention, this fault ballast is to introduce a third party falling agent, for example, coal dust or mineral failure, which was different from what I'm going to talk about later on. So, Dr. Hyde did some like direct shear box with ballast material and simulate the large scale direct shear box test with different particles with different angularities. It's very clear with different uh, shape of the particles, they will give you different behavior. And also for the lateral stability before and after tamping, you can see the different shape of particles will give you different behavior. So the shape properties, so th that's a benefit to quantify the particle shape properties in a great details. And also by changing the particle into particle friction angle, it was able to simulate the fault ballast falling by coal dust. So that's previous study. In 2010, we did a field validation. This is in a fast test uh, facilities in TDCI, Pueblo, Colorado. So four different railway companies donate certain amount of ballast material where we construct a full-scale track. And we got some like materials in, in our lab to use image analysis to quantify the shape properties of different ballast materials. And Use this kind of like information, we can build our DEM simulation model, which is a full scale. This is full scale model, contains about like 13,000 particles in this simulation. Uh, I was mentioned this uh, computation wise is very expensive. To load it up to 2,000 passes, it took up us about like two months or so. And to prepare the model took about another one month to achieve the desired density we want and also the geometry. To load this, uh, to load, it's uh, a lot of researchers use simply just the cyclic loading like sinusoidal or half a sign loading. Uh, we use a four peak load which was divided by a sample model developed by Dr. Hai Huan earlier. So this loading pulse consider the two bogies together which was four wheels. That's why we have four peaks. Apply this load to the model I just showed you, and up to 2,000 cycles, 2,000 passes, we can see different materials give significantly different behavior due to the different shape properties. And uh, later on, we got the field measurement, and uh, we can see we capture the different trend, especially when we have like low angular polarities, it has lower settlement. To compare with the field, we make the extrapolation of our simulation result to compare at 90 MGD million gross tons. They met, they met very well, reasonably accurate with the field measurement, except for railroad tools materials. This is because in railroad tools material, they have the highest flat and elongation ratio, which was very easy to break in the field. However, in the current code, every particle is rigid and we don't allow the particle to break. That's why we didn't perform the high uh, settlement in the simulation. So after that, the current progress is we try to collect the, all the particles throughout of the United States uh, aggregate suppliers, try to build up the library through the image analysis to quantify all the angularity, spread elongation ratio, substructures, information of all the different kinds of materials, many used by railroad. 
And then with that, we try to develop the uh, capability to simulate a larger scale triaxial test. But before we simulate the large scale triaxial test, we would better to do some triaxial test first. And this is the triaxial test machine we have in MPF. And this kind of like track to test the geometry was the sample is uh, 12 inch by 24 inch which is 30 centimeter and 60 centimeters and uh, we can apply different uh, confining pressure in in this case we use 10 15 20 30 psi confining pressure we'll not only be able to do monotonic strength tests we also can be do repeated can do repeated loading tests this is uh, another introduction about the test equipment we have the uh, three LVDTs placed around the sample with 120 degrees apart from each other. We also have a circumferential chain with the LVDT mounted at the center of the specimen to measure the circumferential strength. Mm. For monotonic strength test, we picked the two different strain loads, strain rate. One is uh, called the rapid, rapid shear, which the strain rate is 5% per second. Another is uh, traditional geotechnical shear strain rate, which was 1% per minute. So I will show you a quick video of the rapid shear. The test is finished within two seconds to achieve 10% strength. For the slow shear case, it will take about like five minutes to reach the 10% strength. From the experiment, we surprisingly find the strain rate is not significant to influence the strength properties. No matter you share it quickly or slowly, you get pretty much the similar stress strain behavior during monotonic <coughs> strength test. This is very important later on. So after we have the experimental data, then the challenge is how can we simulate in discrete element method. So first it need a very tiny time step to detect the contact and also make sure there's not too much overlap between each two particles. And the next challenge is how to simulate the flexible membrane behavior. Previous study used rigid boundaries, but that's not flexible at all. And also, how can we calibrate the DEM parameters? But thanks to Dr. Hai, he already calibrated it from the laboratory experiment. So we decide just to use the same. Because once you calibrate it, you don't want to change it anymore. Otherwise, it's not a cal core calibration. And the last challenge is how to reproduce the quasi static loading. It's very difficult in simulation. Our solution is to use the rigid body to simulate the flexible membrane. It does not seem like a flexible membrane, but think about you have a lot of rigid body particles. And then they only can move in radio direction. They are not allowed to move in translation or rotation. And each of them are freely from each other. We use this approach to simulate the uh, flexible membrane. And the, each particle needs certain thickness and the widthness to make sure they overlap with each other. Otherwise, you won't have a closed circle outside the samples. The diameter is the uh, same as the uh, test specimens and uh, also the confine, confining pressure are the same. Here are the four key uh, simulation parameters. The con uh, normal contact stiffness, shear contact stiffness, and inter-particle inter friction angle. This is the specific gravity. So these four parameters are from Dr. Hai's work. So what we calibrate is only the uh, damping ratios. So with this approach, we have the information of the particle grain size distribution, and we also use the image analysis to quantify all the shape properties. And then we generate all the um, particle elements based on the shape properties and the grain size distribution. Now the next challenge is, we have the flexible membrane, but think about in case of slow shear test, it will take five minutes in the laboratory to finish the test. But in order to simulate the five seconds, uh, five minutes in simulation, it will take about 15 days or even more. Because we need a very tiny time step. How can we speed up the process? So if we think about the 
laboratory, we use a continuous displacement shear, which means with time increasing, the top plate and displacement is keep moving down. But can we have another method to simulate that? We come out a method called incremental displacement shear. Since our stress behavior is not significantly influenced by the uh, strain rate, why not? Let's just totally get rid of time. So instead of continuous shear, you apply a displacement in every time step. Why not? You just introduce the, time, the, the displacement of top platen in just one time step. And then you keep the top platen in the position until the whole system reach re-equilibrium again. You apply the next step of shear displacement. So with this approach, it, it was able to save us a lot of time. So instead of using 15 days or even more, Right now, we can simulate the one shear strength test in about like six or eight hours. So this is how the uh, flexible membrane and the sample looks like. Next, I'll give you a small example of how does the shear behavior simulated in the discrete amber method. So the wire with the mesh of the membrane particles. So we start to shear it. You can see we capture each particle's displacement and rotation translation very, very vivid. And also after the simulation was finished, we were able to capture the flexible membrane bulging. Compare with the uh, experiment the specimens, it's fairly accurate. If you use a rigid boundary to simulate the flexible membrane, you will not be able to capture the bulging at the middle. Here is the comparison between the DM simulation results and the shear strength test result in, uh, from the lab. Uh, here, the, the three DEM simulation results are the average of three simulations. The reason of that is, uh, think about when we prepare experiment test, even for the same amount of particles, you will not be able to put the, exactly the same particles in the same position for three tests. So the initial assembly of the particles is an influence factor. That's why we want to simulate it multiple times, try to get an average. Here is a show from the uh, experiment and also from the DM simulation. We were able to capture the friction angle in about 42 degrees. It is about the correct range, about this kind of like materials. So here is a more detailed explanation why we use three average of DM simulations. So before, uh, if we try to simulate a lot of different uh, simulation with the same particles, but with different initial particle assembly, it will take us a lot of time. But with the help of uh, incremental displacement shear method, we are able to save a lot of time. That's why we will be able to do it. So we performed seven different simulations and took average of the first three, first the five, and first the seven we find the first three is already very promising. So that's why from later on we try to simulate, simulate at least the three of the first case, of the same case. So we finished off simulating the uh, experimental study of the uh, strength test, but sometimes we are more interested in the settlement behavior or the permanent behavior of the ballast materials. So first we did some like repeated loading tests in the lab. The loading pulse is 0.4 second loading duration and 0.6 second rest period between two lo loading pulse. This is a simplified version of the four peak loading pulse from Dr. High's model. And the peak deviator stress is 165.4 kilopascal, it was about 24 psi. And then the confining pressure is 55.1 kilopascal, which is 8 psi. This is how does the experimental specimen settlement look like. We did three and have the average. And up to 10,000 cycles, we have about like 0.5 actual strength. So think about we have a 60 centimeter tall specimen. If you have 
0.5% actual strength, that's about like 3 millimeter. And we also checked the gradation before and after the test. We did not find a significant change of the gradation of these materials. So it is valid for us to use rigid particles to simulate this case of repeated loading test. And also to remind you again, how can we simulate it? It's another challenge. So we have long run time, we have flexing membrane, this is already solved. But now the, time, the problem comes from, it will take 2 hours and 40 minutes in the lab to perform the uh, repeated loading test up to 10,000 cycles. How can we simulate the repeated loading without time? Because we have 0.4 second loading duration and 0.6 second rest period between two loading paths. If we simulate two hours and 40 minutes, I think it's probably take about five to six years to finish the simulation. So what we do is, can we find a way that from incremental displacement shear method to help us? The answer is yes. So in the case of uh, monotonic strength test, what we do is we keep moving the top pattern downward step by step until it achieves the target strength. So in order to simulate the repeated loading test, we just let the top pattern move downward in a very small displacement each step and check the reaction force of the top step of the top pattern until it reached 165 kilopascal, which was 24 psi. Once it achieves that stress we desired, and we move the top pattern upward, which means move it back to reduce the stress until the stress re reduced to zero. And then we'll move it back again. So in this way, we will be able to simulate the repeated loading and save us a lot of time. The flex membrane technique is the same. The simulation parameters are exactly the same. And also the geometry and combining pressure are the same with the lab condition. And here is a comparison between the laboratory test result and DM simulation. You may argue there was some like jump at, at the end. It's about up to 2,000 cycles. But please pay attention. The magnitude is only about 0.5% like actual strength and the jump probably 0.3 or 0.4. And think about this. The magnitude is about 2 millimeters, but your particle distribution is very big. The top, uh, the top size is about 2 inch, which is 50 millimeter. You consider 2 millimeter to 50 millimeter, it's very easy to cause it by one particle, just the rotation a little bit. But in the field, nothing is clean. All the tracks are fouled for, for a certain degree. So how can we simulate the fault ballast behavior? The first question is, how can we get the fault materials? If you go to the field to collect some materials, the variation is going to be significantly great from case to case. So we decide to use the laboratory test to generate the fouling ballast materials and also try to characterize the fouling mechanism in a well-controlled laboratory environment. We use the LA aberration test. There are many tests available and proposed, such as the uh, Devault test, Micro Devault test. But based on the recent literature, the LA aberration test correlated with tractual tests very well. That's why we use this one. So we use 10 kilos of uh, ballast materials and uh, to rot rotate the LA aberration drum to a certain uh, amount of uh, numbers. For granite, we rotate 250 tons. For limestone, we will take 125 turns each test. And then after that, we do a detailed brushing and uh, sieving, try to sieve the material to not let the material lose any fines. And then we can have a gradation change profile throughout the test. So we find up to 1,500 turns, the gradation reached a state that is falling index, which is about 40. The falling index is defined by uh, Professor Selig and Waters in their book. And falling index means the summation of percentage passing number 4 and passing number 20. 
So we can see clearly with uh, LA abrasion drums increase, we have a gradation gradually increase from a uniform gradient to much more well graded. We also visualized all the particle changes throughout the test. So you can see clearly for each sieve size, the number of particles change. And also, even you can see, we, this is, these are high resolution pictures, so you even can see the angularity change from, from the beginning of the test to the end. So we will, ab we will be able to quantify all the shape properties change and gradation change throughout the de particle degradation process. Take an example of uh, southern turns. Yes, a much more zoom in to see a clear picture of particles retained in each sieve size. We can also put them together in a cylinder to see the particle packing. Thanks to Mark to build this one for me. Because here is the original ballast, which was clean and new. And with the following index increasing, at the end of 100, 1,500 turns, you can see the height was decreasing. But one interesting thing is, um, in real world, everything passing uh, three eighths of an uh, inch is considered as uh, waste materials. We call them as fines. So with fines and without fines, you will find the sample's height was, is about the same. So the fines is, is actually do not uh, influence the main structure of the skeleton, while the main, the, the fines will penetrate into the voids created by the big particles. And think about like a uh, falling index approximately 40, all the voids created by the big particles are filling with fines. We repeat the test a lot of times, we can see the result is very consistent. And uh, by repeating the test, we also generate a lot of fault materials, which was able to perform a tractual test. We are interested in three particular states. One is the clean ballast materials, which is the initial state, and also the final state of the fouling materials. And also another gradation is you get rid of all the fines, only have the uh, coarse particle fraction. So the difference between this and this is only you have fines or not. And the difference between this and this is these particles are degraded from these particles but you get rid of all the fines. Uh, you can have the image analysis, you will find the significant shape properties change. Those particles become much more rounded and uh, rounded and smaller, while the new ballast they have much more angular. So here is the gradation of the three different materials. Okay? And we are not able to quantify the shape properties of the fines because they are too tiny. So we perform the experiment repeated loading test with these three different materials. Yes, uh, you, 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 to construct the same dimension of the specimen, you need different weight of the materials, and also it will reach different void ratio. But the compaction time are the same. Here's a result of the repeated loading test results. You can see clearly the three different materials that can be classified to three different groups. But the most significant difference is at the initial part, while the asymptotic increasing is almost the same. Okay, so now the next challenge is how can we simulate this kind of repeated loading test behavior? We, we already simulate the clean ballast one, but how can we simulate the cost fraction one? This is the first step. The difference is the shape properties, especially the angularity index, flat elongation ratio, and the surface texture. So we use image analysis to quantify the shape properties and then to generate particles according to this shape information. With that, we'll be able to simulate the behavior of coarse fraction particles. Fairly accurate. So the next step is how to simulate the fully fouled materials 
with consideration of fines. So it haven't been finished yet. It's still running. I will show the result next time if I have a chance. So when we simulate the clean ballast materials, we think about can we simulate the geo grade reinforcement of the clean ballast materials since geo grade was kind of like become more and more popular in the market right now. Since we have different layers of mem membranes, we are able to capture the deformation of each layer. So why not let's put a single layer of geosynthetics at the middle of the specimen? How can we simulate it? If there are the properties of the geosynthetic we use, the answer is yes. We just put a, a layer of your grid, use rigid elements to simulate the reinforcement. And then we can use this, the clean ballast material and the cost fraction materials, but not consider the fully found yet. And then here's the result of the clean ballast materials and the degraded ballast materials. You may see there's a little bit of overproduct of the geography reinforced case is because in the real laboratory case, geography is just broken. But in the simulation, we do not like the geography to break. So after discussion with my advisor, I finally agreed to do another test. So with a fully fault, but with moisture presented. So now we're dealing with the last case, with moisture. So how can we introduce moisture into the tractor test? For the clean ballast materials, it's free drain materials. If it rains, it doesn't matter. For the cost fraction of the fault ballast, it's also free drain materials. So which part really trapped the moisture into the specimen or into the field is the fine particles. So it makes more sense to use the fine materials to mix with water. The six this is a picture to show the 6% moisture content of the fine materials. It's the moisture content of fine materials. It's not the moisture content of the whole specimen. Before that, we did some like uh, compaction test, also CBR test of the fine material itself. Then we did, uh, decide to use 3%, 6%, 9% moisture content of fine materials to perform the wet test. Here's a picture of show the wet sample. At about 6%, this is a picture taken by 6% of fine materials. We were able to show the whole specimen without the membrane support. Before, we need several students to hold it together to take a picture of this because there's no moisture. So we can clearly see there's a suction effect if you have a little bit of water. But if you have a lot of water, when the fine materials have a lot of water, the whole specimen cannot stand by itself. So instead of seeing if your moisture content increasing, the permanent deformation, the permanent deformation will increase. We will see that depends on how much water you have. I apologize for the crowded plot, but please follow me. The lowest one is the clean ballast materials. And then the this one is the cost fraction. As no water presented. And this blue one is a fully fault without water. But if you have 3% of wet of the fine materials, it actually reduces the permanent deformation. If you have 6%, it further reduces the permanent deformation. It even behave, behaves stronger than the cost fraction. But if you keep increasing, they ruin out everything. It screws the specimen very quickly. So we can perform another 12% wet test because it will destroy our LVDTs. So that's the current status of this research. Uh, how to incorporate the fluid mechanics into this code, it haven't been finished yet. I think that will be maybe the task for next PhD student. With that, I would like to thank all the sponsors for this um, research, Federal Real Administration, AAR and TDCI. Thank you very much for your patience. No questions. How did you do the compaction test? Compaction test, you use the CBR mode, right? 
Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you are limited to size. Yeah, but the top size is three eighths of an inch. Oh, I see. Yeah, you only do the compaction depth of about the fines. It's not the everything. Okay. Only the fine materials. I need yeah, you said uh, it took like two months to run yeah. one of the analysis. What kind of machine were you using? Normal PC. Anybody's laptop. Okay. Yeah, it's not like supercomputing. Are you good to me? Mm -hmm. And then do you think of the effects of the membrane uh -huh. the, in your reaction texting? Mm -hmm. the, the effects of the membrane? Because if your membrane is 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 too thick. I think when you contact uh, your specimens, and then the memory will, will be broken. So I think that your memory is is not is not too thick. Thick. I think it's a little thickness. You are talking about the simulation or the uh, experiment. No, I, I think it, I, I I said in your actual texting. Yeah. Do you think the effects of your membrane? I don't think that's a big deal. Because when we compact it, we use the aluminum mode to support the stuff. After compaction, we release the mode, detach the mode. Only use we use a vacuum pump to hold the specimen together. I, I, I said the effects of the uh, membrane on the <coughs> uh, shear strength. Mm -hmm. It depends on how, how how strong the membrane is or the, like how much layers you use, right? Okay. But in our case, I don't think that's a big deal. Because if you do not apply vacuum, the specimen kind of collapse very strong. Yeah. I have some suggestions. If you can think about the, the volume, volume strength. Yes. Uh, in the case of the monotonic shear strength test, we did not use the circumferential chain and the LVDT at the middle because the shear was so quick. It's very easy to damage the LVDT. But however, in the DEM simulation, we will be able to quantify that. That's that's the beauty of numerical simulation. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's it's like sixty-five. Slide sixty-five. Sorry. Yeah, under six, six, yeah, five, six, under. Five, six five under. Oh, the stuff. <laughs> 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 okay, it looks like around 1.5% strain. Both your experimental and your model result have big deep over there. Why? Yeah? Yes. Uh, that is because there's a one case. There's a big jump here. Big drop. Particle deorientation? No, it's, it's what, you know. If I plot all the seven DM simulations, the curve kind of become like this and this. And there's, instead of a curve, it has a band. So I think in the first simulation or the second simulation, there's a big drop here. Yeah, it, it, but when you take average, it's still over there. But it's, a, a, it's a group agreement with your model result. What? It's a group agreement with your model result. Yeah, that is because when you average, it's still there. We did not drop any simulation results. Yep. And it's, it's actually very likely to happen. Why? It's because all the particles are rigid. So instead of rigid, you have like small drop. Sometimes it has the suddenly rotation or reorientation, as Hassan said. And then in that case, in a very tiny time step, it will have suddenly drop of the strings. Dr. Uda? Yeah. Two, I have two questions. First mm -hmm. is that, you know, continue my view. From the very beginning, you uh, avoid using any, 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 one of the, any, any of the continuum theories. I mean, I, it's understandable for such a problem like this. Uh, it might not be applicable to use continuum theories. But the, on the other hand, also continuum theories are very established. Mm -hmm. So what is the size of a geometry, for example, structural dimension that you think that you have to switch to continuum uh, simulations? Because you cannot perform this for every for every structure that you're imagining, right? And at some point, yes. your structure, your your let's say, particle size becomes so smaller mm 
then mm -hmm. your structure, and then you no longer need, for example, such a micro scale simulations or micro uh, discrete element simulations. Do you have an idea about the structural side that you can switch to continuum uh, uh, theories or simulations? Okay. I don't think there's a uh, like very specific boundary between which method you should choose, but it's what kind of like problem you try to solve. For example, if you have a ballast flying problem, no matter what the skill is, you have to go with discrete element method. Because you have a particular particle will have a large scale, will have large movement. But I don't think the continuum based can do that. And also another example, if when we compact the compact the track, the bus layer, it's very likely several particles will roll over to the end. And then in this case you cannot use continuum based. But some other tests, for example the even the like the small strain shear test or the small strain structure test, I think it's be able to solve by continuum based approach. So it's depending on what kind of problem you try to solve. And then the second one is that I'm just curious about how uh, maybe you mentioned it, but I made it, I made it missed it in your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this script element represent the permanent deformation? What is the mechanisms behind the permanent? Are, are you allowing the particle breakage? Uh, we don't allow the particle breakage. Instead, we allow the particle to move. Okay. Yeah. Particle can I, uh, we can, but, but I didn't understand how... The permanent deformation is the same, it's just the uh, same as this case, very similar to this case. So you have monotonic strength test, you just uh, push the top platen down, right? 10% strain or 5% strain. But in, in the case of repeated loading test, it's the same thing. Instead of you use the strain defined target, you use loading defined. So you just apply the load on the top of the balance layer. So the force on top of the ballast layer will be distributed to all the particles. And then particles will have like lateral movement. So you have the permanent deformation from the top. It's the same mechanism as in the field, right? You push from the top, the particles move to the lateral. It's kind of like particle flow. <coughs> Did I answer the question? But, but your friction angle, your, your curve, remains constant, right? That is from the strength test. Okay. Yeah. What's that? Uh, it's a follow-up question mm -hmm. for the membrane issue. Uh, I know that there is no membrane correction. Mm -hmm. And you have answered that, uh, okay, membrane will not affect. But we are using kind of a bracing, you know, uh, for the three LBDDs. Uh, do you mm. think the bracing will affect the results? If you are saying the bracing will apply extra confinement to the specimen, yes, it will apply extra confinement. But depend on your confining pressure and the activator stress you use. So if you use a much higher confining, stress, uh, confining pressure of the specimen, because the confinement from the brace is limited. If you don't have any confining pressure, then I would say the brace is very important to influence the result. But since you have like GPSI confining pressure, it doesn't matter that much. And also, we use a brace to measure only the middle part of the strain. Right? But not, that's the crucial part because yeah. that's where the, I mean, most amount of bulging is happening. Yes. But we did not measure anything that be confined by the brace. Okay. Right? We are measuring the part that, that is not confined by the brace. Are there wants to know? Dr. Maoni has a question? Yes, indeed. Uh, why are you using the average values for shape properties and all things? Is that the question? No. We got two questions now. Okay. Why are you using average values for shape properties so you use size distribution curve for the gradation? Okay. The answer is when you do the numerical simulation, you always find the most the simplest way to do the simulation. If you can simulate a quarter, 
you never simulate a half. If you can simulate a half, you never simulate the full scale. So the reason to use the average is, is already representative enough to reproduce the laboratory experimental behavior in the BM simulation. Indeed, we can do details use every different chip properties for each particles, but how much effort you want to put. And then you lose the beauty of numerical simulation. So the question is, for example, when we do the field image analysis, you go to the field and you take the picture. How much representative you think the picture is? Consider you take about a picture of 100 particles, and there were billions of particles in the track. Do you think the result is representative now? The answer is definitely not. But why we can use that is because we use a parameter that is, you think is representative enough to reproduce the result. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, thank you. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Better response. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.